Crossroads family. Good to see everyone. Uh, it's it's kind of different being down on the floor instead of behind a keyboard. That was awesome. And I told myself in the first service that I wouldn't sing as loud in the second service, so I'd still have a voice. And that did not happen, but thankfully I still have a voice. <laughs> uh, good to see all you guys this morning. I want to start off with a question. Have you ever had your world just totally turned upside down? Have you ever had like your personal bubble of what you think is important uh, totally popped? Or maybe a time in life when life as you knew it all of a sudden became a lot more large and magnificent and mysterious than you'd ever imagined? I can think of several times in my life, of course, when I invited Jesus into my heart, that was a huge one. But the one that really comes to mind is when we had our first son, Amy and I, and we had our first son, Quinn, and uh, our whole worlds were turned upside down. Um, in awesome ways and in challenging ways. I mean, we were totally mesmerized by this bundle of cuteness, uh, you know, and yeah, I can remember how challenging it was in the first few weeks for me because I suddenly became so aware of how innately selfish I was with my own time, with my desires, with my priorities. And um, I can remember actually feeling sorry for myself at nighttime sometimes. We would finally get him down for like maybe a half hour. And I don't know if Amy remembers this, but I would actually pout a little bit and feel sorry for myself that I didn't have the time that I used to have. <laughs> you know, and just like for any parent, there was a shifting going on in me between things that were important and things that were not important. And I would say that even today, my priorities and my values have changed because of that. And it, it doesn't always make for an easier life, but it's one that I wouldn't change for the whole world. I wouldn't change it for anything. And that's what happened with those that believed and followed in Jesus because their worlds were turned upside down by this guy. This, he was no ordinary man. He was unordinary. He was extraordinary. And he spoke in a language that they weren't used to. And he lived by principles that were, I think were countercultural even to this day. And so that's what we want to talk about today. What, what made him no ordinary man? And we've kind of been joking with the staff. You know, we've, other than Palm Sunday and Easter, with this story journey we're in, there's really only like three, maybe four chapters that cover the life and ministry of Jesus. And that really doesn't do it justice. You know, we're really just barely able to scratch the surface of all he is for us. But I hope to just touch on a few big things about his heart and his purpose this morning that made him no ordinary man. So the first one is this. Jesus had a heart and a passion for the kingdom of God, or you could call it the kingdom of heaven. As you read through the scriptures, you, you hear him say it both ways. This reality of the kingdom of God was super important to him. As you read through the story, through the New Testament, he mentions the kingdom of God over 60 times over 60 times. And I think that for the majority of us that probably grew up in a democracy, sometimes the idea of, of a kingdom, of a monarchy can be a little bit hard to grasp or, or align with, right? You know, we may have different images that come in mind when we think of a kingdom. And here's the interesting thing is that the listeners, the Jewish listeners in particular in his day, also had some preconceived notions about what this coming kingdom would look like. It didn't really jive with what he was teaching. You know, his Jewish listeners were tired. They were tired of being oppressed by the Roman government and authorities, and they were yearning for this new kingdom and Messiah that the Old Testament prophets had been talking about. But what happened is that they started to misinterpret some of those scriptures. See, they had it in their minds that these Old Testament prophecies um, were, were telling that this Messiah would come in and he would be this victorious political ruler and he would just overthrow Rome with a vengeance. Why were they misinterpreting some of these things, some of these old prophecies? Well, I think there's lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is that a lot of these old prophecies were, were multifaceted. They described events that are all gonna occur and yet not all in the same time period. And as you start to look back at some of them, you start to notice that it's, it's kind of like, um, a mountain range. You know, I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, so I'm kind of a mountain boy and I love, I love mountains. And if you've ever been hiking and you're looking off at the mountains in a distance, you see them all there and they look like they're kind of close, right? The different peaks. But a lot of times as you start to hike closer, you'll notice that there's valleys or gaps in between some of those mountain peaks and they're not right together. And that's kind of the way it is with some of these old prophecies. And I'm not going to read it right now, but write down Zechariah chapter 9. Grab out your Bibles later. Read Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and following. And it's just a great uh, example of one of these prophecies that I think Jesus' listeners got confused because some of those scriptures talk about things that were already fulfilled when Christ first came, like him riding on a donkey's colt, which we'll get to on Palm Sunday. But then a lot of the prophecies in that same passage have yet to occur. They're going to occur when Christ comes back again. And so Jesus was constantly stunning his listeners as he would talk about this kingdom of God because it was a really different kind of kingdom than what they were expecting. And just like with these Old Testament prophecies about the kingdom, if you look at all the teachings of Jesus about the kingdom of God, you'll start to notice there's this beautiful mystery about it. And I wanna describe it like this. The kingdom of God is both already and it's not yet. 
It's both already and not yet. And you'll see that Jesus is teaching that the kingdom is both a present reality now because of him, and yet it's also a future reality, a future event. And so in essence, we're all kind of living in between those times right now, you know, and I know that we all know that tension of, of living in this world where we have freedom now in his name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, but we still live in a fallen world, right, where stuff's gonna happen. The world's not yet fully renewed until he comes again. But as we live for him and discover what it means to live this kingdom of God out in our daily experience, we're gonna to start to catch glimpses of this future glory that's coming. That's the already, but the not yet. And it's kind of a hard concept, I think, maybe to grasp, but um, I thought maybe uh, just to give you a quick little illustration of this, I would show you some more cuteness. So um, those of you that know our family know that we have a little bit of an addiction in collecting um, animals. We are up to quite a few at the house right now. Last summer, we really did it big. We, we fostered not one, but two litters of puppies. This was the second litter. And, uh, you know, when we first got them, they couldn't have, they, they weren't allowed to go out with the big dogs because they, you know, didn't have their vaccinations yet. And then even when we brought them home, uh, they had to stay in our garage and they would only get to see the big outside world every once in a while when we would open the doors because they were just riddled with worms and had fungal stuff going on. I mean, it was nasty. But this, that was footage of when we were first able to let them out into this bigger reality once they had had that final set of vaccinations, you know, it was already, but not yet. And then now they're really living the good life and that, their kingdom, right? This is uh, KK. She's my baby girl. She's the princess of quite a lot, we say. Uh, and then Barney and Russ, which actually a couple of our uh, friends here at, at Crossroads have adopted, you know? It's the already, but the not yet. How did Jesus portray the kingdom of God? There's so many ways that he did this and there's so many scriptures we could look at, but I just want to quickly hit a few this morning. So let's do that. So the kingdom of God is accessible. It's accessible and it's already because of him, in him, because of his unique relationship with God the Father, Jesus taught that the kingdom of God has been brought near in himself. Listen to the scripture from John 6. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. And that can happen right now. The kingdom of God is accessible and already in him. And Jesus talked about it often, having been brought near because of him. Here's another one. The kingdom of God is a priceless treasure. It's a priceless treasure that refocuses our heart and our energies. And there's a scripture in Matthew 13 where Jesus says this. He says, the kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again. And he sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field so he could get that priceless treasure. Isn't that awesome? The kingdom of God is a priceless treasure. It's to be sought after with all that we have and all that we are. Are we devoting that kind of energy in our pursuit of Christ? You know, I think the beauty of, of focusing on this priceless treasure is that we'll find ourselves, among other things, with less anxiety, with less worry. And, you know, there's a longer passage where Jesus is talking about not worrying, and he says this. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And I'm really preaching to myself on this one, but those of you that may have been uh, curious enough about me to maybe look on the Crossroads webpage at some point, we've got our little staff pictures and bios. And at the end of mine, I think it's still up there. It says, on my bucket list of things before I turn 40 is to be the proud owner of an old Jeep Wrangler. And uh, a few weeks ago, Amy and I, we, one of our neighbors had this old one and, and we got the opportunity to like look at it and think about buying it. I mean, y'all, this thing was literally falling apart. I mean, it looked like dogs just come and chewed on the seats for a couple hours and it was just trash in it. And then finally the catch all, I mean, we could see rust on it, but when I got it up on a lift, it thing was just literally falling apart. And I was so captivated by it though. I just wanted it so bad. <laughs> um, and, but I, as the day went on, I found myself actually getting more stressed and worried about the whole thing possibility of even buying this Jeep because of you know, how, am I, how am I going to fix all this stuff? I can barely afford it as it is, you know, rather than seek God's kingdom first, trust God, trust that he knows the desires of my heart. He knows what I need and when I need it, and he'll make it all happen in his timing if it's meant to happen. Seek his kingdom first. The kingdom of God is a priceless treasure that refocuses our heart and our energies. And the kingdom of God is also this. It's a seed. It's a seed that is received in us and that grows exponentially in us and through us. And there's some really beautiful um, stories called parables that Jesus uses to show that the kingdom of God is like this. It doesn't really start or grow like we think. 
And I'm only gonna focus on one today. You can find a lot of them in your story chapter this upcoming week. Uh, but the premise of a lot of these parables is this. The kingdom can be very subtle. It can be like a seed that when it, when it hits fertile ground, which it doesn't always do that, it takes root and then it blossoms into a plant in a really mysterious way. And I love that Jesus uses the mustard seed as one of his examples. Listen to this um, parable, this illustration. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. I love that illustration. You know, a few years ago, I, I don't really know a lot about mustard. We've, we've tried to do a garden these past several years, so I'm getting a little, a little bit more. My wife is really the gardener. But uh, I, I, I did some research on mustard a few years ago, and I found out this really cool fact about it. It's in this whole class of plants where when you plant it, it actually removes contaminants from the ground around it. It sucks it up into itself and removes contaminants. And for years, it's called phytoremediation. That's the kind of big technical fancy name for it. But it's actually mustard and other plants have been used like this in farms all across the world um, for phytoremediation to remove the contaminants from it. Isn't that a beautiful picture? I don't know if Jesus uh, shared that with his disciples. I'm sure he knew about that. That's mustard. It removes contaminants and it grows exponentially for something that's so seemingly small. Have we received that kingdom seed inside us? Is it growing inside us? Are we changing the atmosphere and the ground around us just like that mustard seed because of this kingdom? Jesus was no ordinary man. He was no ordinary man because of his heart for that kingdom of God and he made it accessible because of himself and he called us to seek it with all that we are and let it grow as we live in this, this already but not yet. Another big thing is that Jesus was all, also no ordinary man because of his heart for the lost, for the broken, for the not good enough. And I just love that about him because you know, those are not really the sought after types of people in the world, right? And I've been there, am there so often. I'm so grateful that that's the kind of people that he seeks after. In so many ways, he taught us that lost things matter to God and so they should matter to us. And that's actually one of our core values, one of the things that makes Crossroads tick. And I'm so thankful for that. Listen to this beautiful story from the Gospel of Luke. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for that one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In that same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus would go out of his way. He still goes out of his way to save and to reach the broken. And he was constantly showing that. And maybe, it's, maybe something in your soul right now just rises up. Maybe you've been that right now. You've been lost and you've been kind of tired and wandering. Just know that Jesus is pursuing you. He's left those 99 to go right after you. We can also see um, Jesus' heart for the not good enoughs in his choice of his disciples. And it, again, it just makes me feel better, you know, when I read through these passages of them following him around and they just seem like so often they didn't get it, right? <laughs> you know, but growing up in Galilee in this Orthodox Jewish region, it would have been tradition for Jewish children to begin their education in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, when they were about six years old. That's when it was started. And they would have literally started to memorize. Can you imagine memorizing by heart the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis through Deuteronomy? And by the time they had reached 10 years old, only the best could move on to that next level of education under the rabbi where they would continue to learn to memorize the Torah, among other things. But the, what happened with the rest? Well, the rest would go back to their families, uh, their family trades, whatever that was. For a lot of the disciples, obviously we know it was fishermen. And then by the time you hit 14 or 15, only the best of the best were left under this Torah school. And these guys, get this, they had memorized not just the Torah, but the entire, what we know is the entire Old Testament scriptures, Genesis through Malachi, by heart, verbatim. Can you imagine that? And it was all by word then, and nothing was written down that yet anyway. Those were the best of the best. And so then what they did was they applied to become a disciple of the rabbi. They wanted to become exactly like them and follow them everywhere. And so then those few students that were left would go through a ton of grueling work and testing. And then in the end, it was the rabbi who would choose the disciple, the one that they thought could be just like them. And the rabbi would come to that, per that student, that disciple, and they would say, come, follow me. Those are the words they would say, come, follow me. So 
Here's the really interesting thing. By the time we meet the disciples in the scriptures, they, were, they had already not made the cut, right? They were already back living with their families, doing their family trade. Nothing wrong with that, but they were, they were kind of the not good enough. So imagine that feeling that rose up in them when they heard Jesus come to them and say, come, follow me. Just imagine they were blown away because Jesus saw the potential in them when others didn't. And he sees the same in each one of us where the world's gonna tell you you're not good enough. God sees you in a different light. He sees you as his child called to be a part of the kingdom of God and to spread it. He was no ordinary man because of his heart for the lost, for the not good enoughs, for the broken. And uh, I've just recently finished reading through the gospel of Mark again. And uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me about this book in the Bible is that so much of it involves Jesus healing people. It was just over and over again, Jesus healing people, whether it was by prayer or even sometimes from a distance or even indirectly as they reach out to him and touch him. You know, Pastor Lowell told me one time that if you go through all the gospel accounts, 75% of the gospels are either Jesus going to heal someone, healing someone, or leaving from healing someone. And usually then he was on his way to teach and heal someone else again. It's just amazing. There's so many healing stories. And one, I'm not gonna read the actual scripture, but um, I read this to my boys a couple weeks ago. It's kind of a spooky story. A demon-possessed man running around in a cemetery nothing could control him anymore. He was just out of control because he had not one demon, but a legion of demons inside him. And yet at the sight of Jesus, the demons know exactly who he is. They proclaim that he's the son of God most high and they don't even resist. There's nothing they can do. All they can do is ask for a reassignment into a herd of pigs and Jesus gives them permission and the pigs plummet to their death and those demons are destroyed. And then there's a huge difference in how the people respond when you read that scripture. So here's this guy, he had once been just out of control and now he's fully clothed, fully sane, perfectly healed. And the response of the crowd, the people that are around, it's not what you would think. They plead with Jesus to go away and to leave them alone. Isn't that sad? God, wait, we can't handle this. It's too much for us. But the man who is healed goes all throughout the surrounding regions, sharing his testimony, sharing the great things that Jesus has done. And many believed because of his testimony. And I, just as I read through that, that scripture again this past week, it reminds me of what Lowell shared last week. You know, if, if, if we are looking for a miracle, if we're looking for belief, to believe in what God's doing, we're gonna see it. But if we're looking to complain or grumble or deny, our hearts are gonna be hardened even more. So may we be people that are open and ready for God to move in big ways. And then there's this other story. And y'all, this is, this is, I can't get this passage out of my head. I'm gonna read it and share some things. Mark 5, and it's also in your story chapter. So Jesus is on his way to heal a girl who's sick, but then another healing happens. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. And immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. And so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. And then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Such a beautiful passage, isn't it? You know, this woman, she sensed the anointing on Jesus and this, this desperation for the healing of God just rises up in her. And what does she do next? Nothing that really makes sense by our standards, nothing that you could have predicted, nothing that had ever been taught by Jesus as a, a way to get your hair cool, you know, come touch my robe, then you'll get your healing. And yet in that moment, her faith comes alive. Her faith rises up, the Holy Spirit in her is saying, this guy is who he says he is. And she just feels compelled to press through that throng, to press through that crowd and reach out for him and touch his garment. And that act becomes the contact point of her faith in him because it's being poured out wholeheartedly in him and that healing occurs. It wasn't the garment, it was her faith in him and the Holy Spirit rising up in her. Jesus' heart is for the lost and the broken and the hurting and the beauty 
of all of this is that that is still his heart today. It wasn't just a thing for New Testament times. It is still a thing today. And one of our core values here at Crossroads is that Jesus still heals today. And we believe that we get to be a part of that. We know that we get to be a part of that. He's given us that authority to ask for healing in his name, not only for ourselves, but for others. Listen to these scriptures. These are not on the screens, but Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. John 14, verses 12 through 14. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. One of the reasons why we always try to make time for space and time and space for prayer in our worship services on Sundays and in other times is because we believe so strongly in this. I mean, y'all, we have, if you talk with Linda, any of the staff, we have witnessed countless miracles, healings, relationships restored, finances brought back into wholeness, new callings, purpose, all kinds of things, and it's all because of God. So let's not be negligent in partnering with him in prayer. It's God who's the one who moves the mountains, but he calls us not to be negligent in partnering with prayer, partnering with him in prayer for his movement. And then finally, you know, how can we respond? How can we kind of wrap all this up and, and respond to this, this Jesus, this one who brought the kingdom of God near, this one who has a heart for the lost and the broken? And I, we just read through that passage about the bleeding woman, and I've already shared some stuff, but uh, all the way up to the end of this past week, I just felt like, God, I mean, this passage has never really stuck out to me like this before. There's something else that you want to say, and I've already kind of written some stuff down. I don't know, I just feel like there's something else. And then y'all on Friday, I had probably one of the most profound experiences with God that I've ever had in my life. I had uh, just a great afternoon. Um, spent some great time on discussion and prayer with Zach and Elizabeth who had taken the youth to a, the ramp conference last weekend and they were just on fire with what God had done. And then after they left, I was just praying some more and I was just all of a sudden undone by the presence of God. I mean, undone to the point where I, I was shaking. All I could do was walk over my office. I turned the lights off and I laid prostrate on the ground and just wept. I wept. And it was a weeping of joyful desperation because what I heard God speaking to my heart was this. He, he said, you know, Mike, the, the bleeding woman has been you. The bleeding woman has been the American church for too long, you've been stuck in a condition. For too long, you've been allowing the fear of man and the schemes of the enemy to crowd me out. The work that I really wanna do in you and around you. It's time to stop bleeding. He said, it's time to stop bleeding. It's time to reach out and for the hem of my garment, to reach out for me, you know? I've been in ministry for 17 years. It's kinda hard to believe. <laughs> Volunteering before that. and. In ministry, you know, we spend so much time um, talking about, thinking about methods and strategies and mission statements and how to connect with people and what a worship service should or shouldn't have or should look like or should not look like. And those, are, those things are all well, those things are all good. But what I think God is really calling us to is to be like that bleeding woman who finally had enough. She had a joyful desperation for the presence and the power of God, for that kingdom of God's seed. And she was ready to do whatever it took to push through the crowd, to push through anything that the enemy would want to throw our way, to keep her away from him, and reach out for his heart. And so she did, right? And Jesus turned around. The disciples said, no, 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 keep, keep going, keep going. You know, don't worry about who touched you. No, he turned around. He looked her in the eye. She's at his feet. And he got to know her in an intimate way, even if it was only for those few moments there. That's breakthrough. That's the kingdom of God happening right there. You know, when, uh, when I was in the hiring process here at Crossroads about five years ago, I was sitting in the Chick-fil-A up at Afton Ridge and um, it was me and Pastor Lowell and uh, Mark Carnes, y'all remember Mark? We were sitting there in the Chick-fil-A eating and, and uh, Pastor Lowell asked me, he said, Mike, what's your biggest dream in ministry? And without hesitating, I said, my biggest dream is to be a lead worshiper, not a worship leader where there's like people that are just mimicking everything I say and do, and, but a, a, a lead worshiper 
It's modeling someone who's just passionate and sold out for God, so desperate for his presence, because that's what transforms the, the church to becoming a house of worshipers, a house of prayer, a house of healing, a house of freedom that is known far and wide for being no ordinary church. That's my dream, where there's a revival mindset in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. We're expecting God to do big things for his glory, for his glory. And it starts with me, and it starts with you guys. Last fall, Pastor Lowell, uh, we had just an amazing staff morning on a Tuesday, and he just started sharing some amazing visions with the staff, and we were all just getting excited. And, yes, God, yes, God. And one of the things that he said was that he sees that this place is going to become a flagship, a flagship that other churches and other people look to for healing and freedom and restoration and worship. A church that is not ordinary, a church that is tired of the schemes of the enemy. And y'all, this church has been through so much. We have been rocked to the core, but now we're ready to rock the enemy to the core and let God break out like he never has before. And it's probably gonna be, it's probably gonna be messy in a good way. I'm so ready for it. I'm ready for that breakthrough. And I don't even begin to have all the answers of well, what can we do? How, how can we allow that to happen? But I just know that it starts on a person to person basis, that kingdom seed growing and expanding inside of us, right? So as we close real quick, how can we do that? How can we be no ordinary people and thus no ordinary church? Well, one of the things I think that we're called to as Christ followers is to host his presence we haven't gotten to this scripture yet in the story, but in 1 Corinthians, there's a scripture where God says that, you know what? If you're a believer in God, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have all the fullness of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and on you. We are carriers of his presence. And we never know when God's anointing and presence on us and in us is gonna become the contact point for someone else's faith to rise up. Last week, if you were here, we had a testimony video. It just blew my mind a little prophetic word that Michael Baker shared during our quiet Christmas service where he was talking about, you know, all of us, we have our rows, we have our spheres of influence and we're called to impact people. That little word transformed Brian Brashear and before we knew it, he was feeling called to reach out to this family that was in need at his school and all he and all the administrators were just getting donations left and right. That is hosting the presence, that's a testimony. We're called to host his presence just like the disciples did, where their testimony of the good news of Jesus was spreading and they had the authority to, 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 to release freedom over lives, to care for the broken and the forgotten. And Jesus has given each one of us that same authority if we are believers, as well as just a plethora of fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not just for those of us that are on the stage or the pastors and staff, y'all, it's for each one of us. And another key to being no ordinary people, I think, is this might seem kind of simplistic, but going back to the great commandment that Jesus shared, you know, and his disciples said, hey, could you kind of summarize this up for us, all these kingdom of God principles? And he said, yeah, sure. Love the Lord your God with what? With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's right, yeah. And this may seem kind of simplistic, but what if we were each for, for a season really to focus on that and say, God, show me, show us. What does that mean for me? To, to honestly ask God, how would you more deeply hear your heart and the more deeply love you and to love others? I encourage you to go for that ask because I tell you that the, the answers may surprise you. <laughs> and then finally, what if we ask God to change the condition of our hearts, to, to break our hearts for what breaks his because that is when we'll find ourselves blessed and we'll find ourselves becoming a greater conduit for his heart and for the spreading of his kingdom. And just quickly, I gotta go back to Friday. So there I was, a blubbering mess on the floor. And then I finally was able to get myself back up to my desk and uh, had my email open, had my Facebook open. And I had a friend from uh, our previous church that she used to be a part of um, a midweek service that we led. And uh, she posted a video of one of our worship nights that we were having and the band was playing and it was the last night before her son, who was our bass player, went off to a YWAM, Youth With A Mission. And uh, she was just posting it because she was reminiscing and uh, I was like, I'm curious, what, what song are they doing? I was curious. Um, so I clicked on it and it was uh, Hosanna, the hill song Hosanna. And I was like, God, you are so good because the words from this song are right out, of, right out of what we're talking about. God, break our hearts for what breaks yours excite our hearts for what excites yours. The verses in that song 
One of them says, I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith. I see a near revival stirring as we pray and we seek and we're on our knees. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you've loved me. That's my prayer for us this morning. It's my prayer for us as we go forward in this new day. So as we close, I just wanna invite you now to, to close your eyes. I'm gonna read through um, the Beatitudes. Hear God's heart to you this morning. Just take some time in the stillness. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Jesus, you are no ordinary man. You are the savior of the universe. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. God, and we just, as a body, show us how we can press through that crowd, God, to say no more to the fear of man, no more to the schemes of the enemy, God, but to reach out for your garment together. We desire your heart. So as we close today, I'm gonna to invite the, the altar team members up to the front and we're just gonna have a time of ministry, a time of prayer. Maybe you would like to come up and, and just have them agree with you in prayer for anything that's going on in your heart and your soul right now. Or maybe you wanna take some time and pray with, talk with someone that's right next to you. Ask them, how is it with their heart? How is it with their soul? Take this time between you and God. I just encourage you to, to do this before we go our separate ways today. So be blessed.